In this video segment, I'm going to talk about logic models. Now, there isn't a separate standard explicitly for logic models, although it, although it is required that a program submit its logic model as part of standard 1.3. You may recall from the video segment on standard one that there was a brief mention of logic models, and here's where we're going to explain what they are, how to construct them, and how they're used by both the program and by COPRA during the accreditation review. NASPA staff and members of COPRA receive a lot of questions about what is the difference between the requirements of standard 1.3, which is about assessing program performance, and standard five, which is about assessing student learning or competencies. The logic model helps illustrate that difference. It's about connecting the dots. We say that NASPA accreditation is mission driven, and that means that the mission is the influencing, guiding decisions not only with respect to each of the other substantive standards, but also in terms of each stage of the process, inputs, outputs, outcomes, all of those are driven by the mission. And all of those need to be assessed. And that whole model of how the mission drives decisions regarding inputs, activities, outputs, outcomes, and how the program assesses all of those things is really what is encompassed by a logic model. As with all the other video segments, you can pause a video and look more closely at the contents as you go along. I also encourage you before or after you view this video to download the slides and look at the notes that accompany them because they have additional details that I'm not going to talk about. The videos are not intended to be a substitute for the Accreditation Institute and in fact there are exercises at the Accreditation Institute specifically related to logic models that will help clarify and apply some of the concepts that I'll talk about here. You may recall this graphic presentation from the video segment on standard one. With a logic model, you're actually able to explain this, not just have this picture, but actually explain how the component parts are connected, how inputs feed into activities and strategies, how those generate outputs, which in turn hopefully result in the outcomes that you're looking for, and how you assess all of those things and feed that back into additional inputs, strategies, et cetera. At the center of the model is the mission statement because it's driving everything. So a logic model essentially is portrayed here, except that we don't have the details. Within your program, what are the inputs? Within your program, what are the activities and strategies that you engage, engage in? And most importantly, at the center of that model, for your program, what is the mission? And then the logic model also needs to explain the how. How are these connected? Just listing them and putting them in a model that uses arrows doesn't explain how they're connected. And the idea of a logic model is that you explain the underlying logic. This is not the only way to present a logic model. So let me show you an alternative format. Here you have traditional rows and columns. And let me just highlight a couple of things about this model that's a little bit different than the previous um, depiction. First, across the top, you can see the mission. Instead of placing it at the center, we place it at the top. Both of those kinds of portrayals have meaning and significance. Then you have a series of columns, inputs, activities and strategies, outputs, outcomes or impacts. These are similar to those dots or those circles on the previous graph. But here you also have the benefit of some examples in each of those categories. Examples of inputs, the number of faculty that you have, the diversity of your faculty, the number of students, the number of staff. Examples of activities and strategies that you might engage in, the meetings that you hold, um, the classes you offer, the different specializations you offer in your program. Uh, 
inviting diverse guest speakers to your classes. Those all might be strategies or things that you do. And then outputs, the quantifiable ways we can count what you're doing. The number of classes, the number of paid internships, the number of dollars, amount of dollars that faculty generate in grant funding, the number of projects students engage in in the community or the number of hours they volunteer in the community. And then ultimately, the outcomes or the impacts that students earn degrees with certain competencies, that your faculty are recognized for the quality of services, um, that their research informs new theories, any number of different things. But all of these things should be driven by your mission. So the student composition, the number of students that you have and the type of students you have is listed in the input column, but it should be driven by your mission as was discussed in the video regarding standard four and student services and your recruitment and admission practices. Your activities and strategies, for example, inviting diverse guest speakers to speak to your in your classes might be part of your diversity plan that you presented in conjunction with standards three and four, but it's related to your mission. When you say you're inviting diverse guest speakers, what do you mean by that? And how is that related to your mission? So, you may have in your AQ and PQ definitions, academically qualified and professionally qualified definitions in standard three. You may have identified in conjunction with your mission what kinds of publications are most valued by your program. And then you're counting those in, as an output. In standard one, and probably in several other places, during your self-study report, you were asked to identify your performance expectations. And these are your output, your outcomes or your impacts. And they also are driven by mission. And then this graphic representation, this table shows at the bottom, across the bottom, affecting all of these areas, is assessment. Because you need to be assessing how you're doing on inputs, on activities, on outputs, on outcomes. So how do you link assessment measures to all of these different component parts? Here's just one sample of how you might do that. It shows a few, just two examples of inputs, two examples of outputs, two examples of outcomes. And below that, connected by the black arrows, the corresponding assessment measures, ways in which you might gather information to see how well you're doing in achieving your mission in terms of inputs, outputs, and outcomes. On this particular table, you can also see, start to see the connection between standard 1.3, which is where you're presenting this logic model in the context of overall assessment of performance for the program, and standard five about student learning competencies. Those items listed in the table in yellow, student competencies and how you're assessing them, are examples of what's required in the standards under standard five. All the rest, the whole model, is what's required for standard 1.3. This is where you're assessing the program as a whole. Now you might remember when we talked in the video segment about standard one, that we had this model, this cyclical model linking all the dots, all the stages, and there were red flags. There was that symbol for red flags. So let's talk about a few examples of what might be red flags within the context of a logic model. The most obvious red flag, the most glaring, um, red flag that will capture the attention of COPRA is the absence of a logic model. But more likely, because the self-study instructions say you have to upload your logic model, what's going to be a potential red flag is if you don't make the connections, if you don't show how your decisions regarding inputs and activities and outputs and outcomes are driven by your mission. So you simply say, these are the things we do without saying why. These are the ways we measure faculty performance without ever linking it to um, your mission. Or 
You say these things are important, but you don't measure them. And so you never actually assess how well you're doing on those things. Those are the potential red flags. Those are the places where COPER is going to ask you to provide more information and probably also ask the site visit team to gather more information. And it may be you simply neglected to provide the documentation, but you actually have it. You have a mission-based reason for what you're doing and what you're not doing. And it may be that you just didn't include it in the logic model or provide enough explanation. But you can avoid those red flag problems by having a very clear logic model. So now that you have a sense of what a logic model is and what it's trying to accomplish, how do you actually develop one? You start, obviously, with your mission. That is the starting point for everything within NASPA accreditation. Your mission, the related goals and objectives and public service values are the place where you draw the, the guidance for what you should do everywhere else. Now the logical way to approach a logic model might seem like it would be in a linear way. Start with a mission, go to inputs, then next to activities, outputs, outcomes, and finally assessment. Let me suggest a slightly different version that's kind of a variation on working backwards. We will start, still start with the mission. The mission is being across the top. But then start next with the desired impacts or outcomes of your program. In the ideal world, given your mission, what kind of changes would result in the community, in the profession, in organizations, in policies, because your program exists. And this is your program as a whole. It includes your students who graduate with the knowledge and skills that you've helped them attain, who go on to do wonderful things. What kind of changes would occur as a result of their being part of the public service professional community? Your program includes your faculty their service activities, their teaching, and their research. In the ideal world, what impact do you want that research to have on the community, on the profession? So start with your mission, and then next identify outputs or impacts that are desired in the context of that mission. Once you have that list identified, take one step back. In order to have those impacts, what kinds of Outputs would be necessary. Well, faculty research can't be changing the way people are thinking in our field unless it's actually disseminated in some way, published, shared. So an output that you might expect might be publications. Students can't go on and make public organizations better places unless they graduate, and unless they graduate with the competencies that you've said they'll acquire. Once you have a list of outputs necessary to achieve your outcomes, take one more step back. What activities or strategies do you need to engage in at a programmatic level in order to achieve those outputs? Well, faculty can't publish their research unless they do their research. And so that might be gathering data, conducting interviews, getting grants to fund their research or at least applying for grants so that they can get those grants. So what kinds of activities? Your students can't learn unless there are some classes. If you want them to have certain kinds of skills, your classes need to include activities and exercises that help develop those skills. All of those things are components of your activities and strategies. And then ultimately, what inputs, what resources do you need to engage in those activities or strategies? You can't offer classes if you don't have faculty. And there's no need to offer classes if you don't have students. And all of these things cost money. And you need space. So those are the inputs or the resources. And if you work backwards, then you'll see what the connections are. But the final step of a logic model is just as important as all the others. And that is, how will you assess each component part of that logic model? So hopefully you have a sense now of what a logic model is, why it's important, how it's used, where the potential red flags are, and how to construct a logic model for your program. Now this last slide, you've seen it 
projected many times if you've watched the videos in sequence. This time I actually want to emphasize what it says. Because NASPA accreditation is about mission-driven, outcomes-oriented, evidence-based, accreditation earning program management. What does that mean? Mission-driven, we've talked about that a lot. Everything you do should be guided by your mission. Outcomes-oriented, this is not just about how many classes do you teach, what's the content of your curriculum, how many publications do your faculty have, but what are the ultimate outcomes? How are you having an impact on the community, on the profession, on your students? Evidence-based, you need to be able to document what you're doing, why you're doing it, so that COPRA can use that documentation in its decision-making process. If you do these things, it will earn accreditation. But more important than the accreditation earned is that you're managing your program in a strategic way using these principles to improve the quality of public service.